Okay, fantastic. Um, that is always a little bit of a worry to make sure it all works regardless. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation. It's my, my honor and my great pleasure to join this symposium and to talk to you to get today. It's an opportunity for me to make new friends and also to reconnect with old ones such as uh, Lick Hang Hi Lick. And I, I know everything that I know about um, uh, the development of digital humanities in the greater Chinese uh, sorry, in the greater Chinese region by, by listening to his, him talk and to reading his papers. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to talk from a Western perspective, and I want to talk about um, challenges, cooperation, collaboration um, with East Asia. So background, a little bit of background on me and the issues, um, something about digital humanities in East Asia and the West. Not too much about that because Lick Hangers has given you a um, history of uh, East Asia. I want to talk, mention some of the similarities and differences, but also I'm approaching the East Asia research from a, a Western perspective. And, and one of the questions I want to ask is, is how do we know what we know about each other? And what is it that enables us coming together for cooperation and collaboration? Because these are where the challenges come from. Uh, I'm currently, I'm talking to you from London, but I'm currently based in um, a new research centre in uh, Beijing Normal at uh, Zhuhai. But before that, I was director of the Digital Humanities Centre at University College London, which is where you, uh, you may be more familiar with me from. But since moving <coughs> to China, I've been, I've been picking up my existing research um, interests, topics of interest, and topics of research. And one of the things I've been looking at for some time has been diversity, diversity in language, in demographics, in gender, and also research topics. Um, I've become interested in storytelling, part of the oral tradition, and looking at digital storytelling and oral history. But also with regards to education, because I'm employed as a teacher and I was employed as a teacher before, so I'm considering things like Socratic versus Confucian approach to, to teaching, the didactic versus knowledge transfer. But my original academic background was in classical studies. So I've been trying to look at topics um, there to connect with my uh, original academic background. But all of this is with a, within a, sorry, within a Chinese context. And I need to just repeat that my, my um, employment in China is, is fairly recent. So my personal experience is mainly limited to Western Anglophone tradition, but also to mainland China and mainland China only. I've been a frequent visitor, as uh, you may know, you may not know, I don't know, since about 2014, 15. And I've been taking every opportunity to visit um, China when I can, and it'd be my great pleasure to some, at some point, be able to visit your university in Japan. The research centre in Zhuhai is a new one. It's a development of the um, BNU campus at Zhuhai. It's one of the many new centres that have been set up there. And um, when I came, I had um, lots of expectations of being able to, to travel a lot, but all these activities have been limited by the pandemic. The Hong Kong border is closed, anticipated visits no longer possible, and even domestic travel in China is um, severely limited when there's an outbreak anywhere. They tend to close the whole region down. And international travel is um, almost impossible, not quite impossible, but almost impossible. So the best laid schemes, we have all these plans, and then along comes the global pandemic, and we're all learning to live and work within the confines that we've had to become used to with because of the pandemic. Pandemic has forced us all to make changes, certainly forced me to make changes, and it's very, very difficult to make any plans. We can have this event because it's held online, the only way we can have it. Um, I had two main tasks set up for the first year. One was networking and one was recruitment. I was looking to reconnect with my established relationships in, in mainland China, and also to make new connections and develop new relationships within the wider East 
Asian region, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea. I was planning to spend <laughs> a lot of my time traveling around East Asia region. That's uh, not been possible. Recruitment, well, no wide scale promotion of recruitment has been possible because um, we can't give visas to foreigners. And so we've got a large number of vacancies for postdocs and junior lecturers at our campus. But, <coughs> excuse me, um, the talk today is about um, East Asia more widely. And of course, that includes, I found this nice map online. I've got Japan there, mainland China, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, North Korea, and Mongolia. Um, I did meet a scholar from Mongolia at a conference a couple of years ago. So DH is making an appearance there as well. South Korea also very strong. North Korea, I'm not sure about. We don't have any contact with them, them there. But these are different scholarly, scholarly communities and of course different scholarly cultures. And, and I think it was indicated by previous speaker, Lang Hing, these, these communities have grown up differently in the different regions as well. There are similarities and differences and here I'm looking at the differences between the East and the West. There are differences in the humanities data that we study, and these lead to differences in the approaches to the research directions that we take. Um, as mentioned before, there are difficulties with um, OER, things like this, uh, optical character recognition with Chinese text. You've got the technical challenges, the semantic languages, word segmentation. But, but to be clear, uh, this is actually not unique to East Asia and, and, um, and these languages. The text you can see on your screen there, this is a medieval Latin text, and it's what we call scriptura continua. Um, or sometimes capitalist quadrata, and as you, and if you can see, I'm not sure if you can, but it's um, all of the letters or characters are in uppercase, and there is no gaps between the words, and there is no punctuation. So the issues with OCR and these types of texts are very, very similar to those that you experience from, for instance, Chinese texts that we saw earlier. This is also true with um, a lot of scripts from the Indian subcontinent, Hindu and Punjabi, and some Arabic scripts where they're written in a continuous stroke of the pen, or even some of the Mongolian languages where they go vertically, but there's a continuous script to a continuum, continuous curse, a scursive script, cursive script, I guess we call it coming down. Um, diversity between the East and the West, thinking about that again, we both use textual material, but we're looking at different ways now of using our textual material. We're moving away from simply text-based studies. And even where text is our source material, we work in different ways. We look at visualizing, um, making images. We saw some of that with the GIS and things like that. Projects that I've been involved in, you may have heard me speak about before, would be imaging projects using non-invasive, non-destructive techniques to under, under, undercover texts otherwise not visible because they're uh, no longer distinct or the palimpsestic text or something like that. Um, we have work on linked data and open data and a term that I think is very common in China is smart data, where you have data sets that link up together. There are also issues, I think linguistic issues and that is certainly in the West, in Europe, it's a preponderance, a hegemony, if you like, of the English language. There's so much pressure to publish in English. And I think this is true also in East Asia. And I'll come back to that a little later in this talk. And this has the effect of distorting um, publication metrics, citation metrics, and all these types of things that a lot of people are interested in. Um, okay, I'm going to be very briefly over this because you had a good history from the previous speaker, but both in the East and the West, we both started off with um, mass digitization using full text databases. And again, the sources of the text, these are our source material, this is what we work with, and these influence the direction of the research that we take. Uh, and just in case you're not familiar, um, uh, European language is based on, on ancient Greek and Latin. Ancient Greek has got 24 characters, 
classical Latin has 23. In modern English, 26 characters. Okay, you've got uppercase, lowercase, so you don't have in Chinese and similar languages. So put them together and you've got 52 in total. East Asia, difficulty with the numbers of characters as well. You have common, similar linguistic heritage. And a quick search online brought up this, um, um, these statistics here. Um, and it tells me that in Japanese school, the children have to learn 2,000 <laughs> characters. And in kanji, there's more than 50,000. And Chinese, 50,000, more than 50,000 unique characters and more than 7,600 char common characters. And if you go for a university post in a Chinese university, you have to take an exam to uh, make sure you know uh, all your characters. Um, we have Unicode for CJK, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean now. And I, again, I did have a quick look at that. And that includes 21,000 basic characters and more than 92,000. And if you go to download a PDF showing them all, it has a, it's the only one that has a warning on it telling you that it's 35 megabytes on there. And a couple of pictures of typewriters, you know, which you, know, you can see the keyboard as well as the typewriter. Although we have ISO and all these, they're very, very much developed for, for the West, not, not for Eastern languages. So again, um, DH and the West, both use mixed methods, um, as our previous speaker said, uh, and we're moving away from rigid academic boundaries. And I think both in the East and the West, we are looking in what we do with teaching to strengthen digital literacy amongst our students to help them develop the necessary skills. But that is also for scholars as well. And we've moved, when I started in this field many, many years ago, we used to call it applied computing, and then the name changed to humanities computing. And then what we're familiar with now is, is digital humanities. These changes in names also bring about a change in focus. Applied computing, very much a tool to aid the humanities scholar in the research. Humanities computing, a clear a more complete focus on informatics, building on the traditions of textual and language-based scholarship. Digital humanities, however, is, is far less limited and encompasses a much broader range for the inclusion of all digital scholarship within the humanities. And for me, it also indicates another term, and that is one of an equal partnership. Uh, and that is that with research projects in the digital humanities, when you need to recruit technologists to help you to, to be involved in the project, it's not that they're coming to help you, it's that they have a similar research interest. And so the projects we develop must have problems and questions in there that are of interest to the, um, to the technologists as well. In the West, it's still very, mu very much a focus on, on text and the Anglophone world, and um, also the background of our Greco-Roman and heritage when we look back to that, which is interesting because I, I did some research a little while ago for a talk on classics in the East and the West. Um, there's no great, no great dissimilarities. They both study philology, literature, history, art, uh, philosophy, calligraphy, perhaps in, in the East, and also archaeology is a hard science. And um, a brief mention in the context of making connections and building relationships for cooperation and collaboration. We have a um, very nice library in Zhuhai, which they are developing and expanding, bringing it up to the status of Beijing. When I was up there looking for book to read in the very small English language section, one day I came across this all of a sudden. If you're not familiar with these, this is the Harvard University Press, the, the Loeb classical collection of texts. The green ones are um, ancient Greek texts, and the red ones are Latin texts, bilingual translations. So the library has brought all this in to encourage somebody to, um, who's interested in, in, in um, Greek or Roman culture. And when I went to the History Research Center on, on our campus, I, I, this is in translation, a screenshot, I've got Google that translates it. But there are one, two, three, four of the researchers that list ancient studies and, and, and Roman 
um, stuff as a research interest. I found that very surprising. So it is an opportunity for me for like a collaboration there. But a question, and the main question is, you know, how do we know what we know about each other? How is it that we find out about each other? Um, an obvious one for me would be reading other people's work, reading the published papers, speaking to, it, to other people at conferences, at events, listening to talks, having meetings. Um, a lot of it is, you know, what we see online, what we read online, and who we meet and who we speak to. Collaborative working, if we can set up projects for collaborative publishing. A lot of this is predicated by travel. The ability to travel is, is that we've lost recently has impacted, um, I think, quite a long way. But um, for material online, we need to have an a online presence. We need our material to be up there online. And we need to try to develop international collaborative um, projects. We've seen this one already, but uh, I picked out a, a couple of high profile examples. And one is Chinese Bibliographic Database, which, as we've seen, is a collaborative project, a multilingual collaborative project between um, Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies in, in Harvard, Academica Sinica, Institute of History and Philology, and Peking University Research Center for Ancient Chinese History. Our very first speaker managed uh, mentioned a collaboration with the British Library, which is um, five minutes walk from where I was placed before at UCL. And this is another high profile project, the International Dunhuang Project. And I've highlighted there in the center of the screen, you've got collaboration between the British Library, National Library of China, all these other institutes in there that have some connection with Don Huang, they have some of the materials that were in some way collected, liberated, bought, or in some way appropriated from the, the library um, and, and caves in, in Don Huang. Um, and at the top right hand corner of your screen, you can see this is also multilingual, it's in different languages. And for those of you that are used to the interface here, um, they're currently in development of a new interface. This one is very, very old and very, very clunky. And uh, Harvard, I found, researching this talk, um, has a MOOC based on it as well. So good play to them. It is one of um, several Asian um, projects that are foregrounded um, at the British Library and International Dunhuang Project. But spinning off from that is also the Lota Lotus Sutra Manuscript Digitalization Project that um, um, I advised on in the, in the early days, but this is also linked in with the IDP project. <sighs> this is me, um, and this is the first Chinese National Digital Humanities Conference that was held in Donghuang there, and see the mass gathering of people there for the mandatory group conference photo. Yeah, I guess we're not having one for this symposium, but these are the sorts of things where people can get together and uh, come together and share ideas, have conversations, meet up over dinner, coffee, whatever it is. A little bit about digital humanities in a global context. This is a web page for the um, full grounded international. Um, organization for digital humanities, the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. Bottom there, you can see there is a Japanese association, the Mexican association, and a Taiwanese association there. They have an annual conference. 2020 was in um, Ottawa, and you can see there, because Ottawa, Canada, bilingual, it's in English and in French up there. 2021, had to be postponed <coughs> because of the pandemic. And 2022 is being held um, in Tokyo. Great. So it'd be really good to be able to go to that in person. I put in a paper, but I think going in person is probably going to be unlikely. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this is titled Responding to Asian Diversity. And what struck me was when I look at the call for papers, the papers are in English, French, Spanish, German, and Italian. It'd be very nice to have some East Asian languages in there. And in the 
iConference for 2021. They did manage a Chinese language track in there. So we have the um, different associations. Here is a Japanese association for digital humanities. Uh, they also have a conference, which I see in 2019, also at Kansai University. Well done. So you've got a connection there. We've got the Taiwanese Association of Digital Humanities. Great. And they also have a conference here, the International Conference of Digital Archives and Digital Humanities. And it's the 12th one. So looking back through the history of their, their conferences, I can see that they've used this name since 2009. Okay, so that ties in quite well with the dates that were um, put forward by the previous speaker, Lick Hang. So the first International Conference of Digital Archives and Digital Humanities, December um, 2009 at the National Taiwan um, University. Korea has a Digital Humanities Lab at the Academy of Korean Studies. Um, so this is part of what I like to flag up of the engagement with other DHs. How do we come together? How do we make these connections? Well, there's no real substitute for in-person contact, travel, visits, events, gatherings and conferences. Uh, what has changed? We've got a new COVID-19 environment and this is not possible. So we've had to learn new ways of working together and new ways of um, connecting with each other, new ways of working and simply engaging with each other. Events themselves, they encourage and they facilitate engagement, conversations that lead to cooperation, possible collaborations, and also invitations to visit. Um, it would have been great to have been at your university now. And again, here's a mass gathering, the first Chinese um, digital, national, national Digital Humanities Conference. And they've had, um, the second one was at Shanghai Library and the third one was recently at Nanjing. All those people gathered together there, and there's me in the front row, always going with the boss and sit next to the boss, that way you get into the front row. And a smaller gathering at the fourth PKU forum. I want to look at publications now, and I've pulled out a couple of indicative ones. There are many, many ones that I've, I've chosen, but I, I've picked the two main English language digital humanities um, publications, digital scholarship in the humanities, digital humanities um, quarterly. And I've got the, the Journal of uh, Japanese Association of Digital Humanities and, and uh, Digital Humanities Research, the remnant one is there. Um, digital humanities, uh, digital research in the humanities, the current issue there, <clears throat> on the opening page, interestingly, you've got two East Asian publications, uh, one from Shanghai Library and one from um, Shanghai University. Sorry, the first one is Shanghai Library and Shanghai University, and the second one is from, from Japan. If we look at the latest issue, you know, 16 articles and two reviews, eight of these have East Asian authors and contributors from China, from Korea, from Japan, Korea, and there's one there with a collaboration, China, Malaysia, and Taiwan, and the book reviews, China, and China increase. When you compare that with Digital Humanities Quarterly, which is affiliated um, with DSH, you find there are 11 articles and three reviews. All of the authors here are from Europe and North America, none from East Asia, which raises a question, why the difference? Okay. Print or digital publication. The first one is Oxford University Press, print journal, pass online, gold and green open access with clear copyright statement. It's indexed by Web of Science and Scopus. It's listed in SSCI and ANHCI. DHQ is an ad hoc Association of Digital Humanities Organizations publication. It's fully online, fully open access, Creative Commons license. Is indexed by Web of Science, but as an emerging sources citation index. So it's not listed in SSCI and ANHCI. Although these are two self declared affiliated publications, you have a look at the metrics from DSH, significantly higher 
from the matrix from DHQ. So there appears to be a clear preference for East Asian scholars to publish in SSCI and ANHCI journals with higher metrics, despite the difficulty of these being in English language. And that's a topic for another, another discussion, not for today. Um, the Journal of Japanese Association of Digital Humanities had a look through there. And um, yes, that's all openly available. You can click on the links and pull up the articles. Um, volume 5, 2020, various nationalities. They're all published in the English language. The free access, full text available, PDF or HTML. There's no statement on rights. There's no statement on metrics and is not listed in SSCI or ANHCI. Um, I'm aware of the new um, digital humanities research from the iSchool in Remnin, funded by them, because I saw it on social media, but I've had difficulty actually finding it. And what I could find actually was just on, on WeChat, and that was this, with no links to the articles. They all appear to be in Chinese. Fine, why not? It's a Chinese publication. You can probably, I'm, I'm imagining you can track them down in CNKI, uh, which does now have an English language interface, which is great. And um, it has all these articles available. It gives the full Chinese text, many of them. Um, you can search by language so you can pick out the English ones. And have a, I'll have a play around with that later on. Language is clearly a barrier, but it is not the only barrier. There are cultural differences cultural differences for when we publish online. Um, there are design aesthetics. There are differences in decision-making. The use of cultural icons and, and symbols is very different. The typography is very different. Um, the West, Western ones tend to be functional with less clutter on them. Um, Asian ones tend to have a, a preference for those nice pastel colors that you saw, CNG. KI and the um, Japanese Association one. Um, Arabic ones, if you're ever trying to access an Arabic um, uh, page, everything is on the front page because they, they don't follow links. If it's not on the front page, it's not actually there. Now this this is this is where the issue is. Um, this is this is from a sort of teaching to my students um, user experience. And according to Jacob Nielsen's law of internet user experience. Um, users spend most of their times on, on other sites, not yours, so they have build up a certain familiarity with the sites. They have expectations based on their previous experience, and, and this is what happens. Um, in the UK also, we have a mandate now for open access publishing. Um, all the all universities mandate, it has to be published openly. The funding bodies has to be published openly. The, REF, which is a research excellent framework, the system for assessing quality of research in UK universities, is, they will only consider ones that are open access. And now when you're looking for promotion, um, the, the, the promotion committee looks for your publishings that are open access. And a spin-off from that is, is more people read your work. So you get increased citation metrics, which is a, a spin-off. The UNESCO website has a global open access portal that lists um, by region, but it, uh, it lists Asia and the Pacific, so it includes Australia, so it's not particularly helpful. But the, 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 the basing all, this, the, all these things on citation indices it is, is a problem because you need to think about why they were, they were created in the first place. They were created to help librarians deciding which journals to, 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 to buy, not to measure the quality of the research. And they can be skewed um, very, very successfully. Um, and you can have a look online and you find many articles about, you know, um, manipulating the citation metrics where editors and reviewers ask that certain articles are cited to increase their citations. And Clarivite, um, Thompson writers, they um, allow up to 15% self citations in the journals, which is, mm, questionable there as well. Um, and the, the metrics used to calculate these, they're, they're not open and not transparent. So in the West, we're trying to move away from this. And we've got this thing called DORA, 
the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment, to try to eliminate or have a move towards um, away from the use of journal-based metrics for things like promotion, things like that. And we want to have research judged on its own merit rather than the journal that it's, it's, it's published in and to take advantage of the many affordances and opportunities for online publications. We want to take away of these criteria being used for hiring tenure and promotion decisions uh, and other things like that. We want to have more citation of pri primary literature rather than um, moves to increase citation indices. Uh, a move towards open science and open, um, open the, more, the more open agenda in there. And in, unfortunately, in many universities, promotions are dependent on publications, uh, Web of Science, Journalist, SSCI by, by Clarivate. Whereas what we need is we need, uh, we need to impact beyond our own institution. We need to make the work open so that people can read it. We need to make the data open so that our research can be verified. We need to have it open to engage um, partners with, with um, other institutions. We need to take into account for motion, things like consultancy work, pro bono, the, the type of work that we do for free and unpaid. Um, yes, we need publications for um, promotion, but we need so much more research, teaching, what we call institutions, institutional citizenship in the UK, and that means serving on all these different committees through the university. We need the conferences, we need workshops, we need research travel, we need to bring people together. And a good example is this symposium, because I had a look through the pages for this symposium um, for the UK ORCAS here and the open database, which I'm looking forward to hear about a little later on. And then when I was looking through this, I found this page here where we have public uh, programming historians, Satira and TEI, all these things and translations the program historians. So I'm just going to finish up now because I'm over time now, uh, just to reinforce this, the, the, the idea that language is not the only barrier. It's not the only challenge that we face. The academic systems are very different. Translation helps, but we need more. We need access to materials and information online. We need to make sure that we make these connections and we built on these connections here. We need to train our students and staff as well. We need to meet the expectations that we have. We need agreements. This is a very, very tricky one here. The agreements on publication, the named order is something that I found uh, recently in my current job is, is of more significance here. Make sure people get the correct academic credit for their work. The ability to make connections, to establish relationships and create networks. is also dependent on institutional and financial constraints. Without communication, there can be no exchange of ideas that lead to collaboration, which is essential constituent in digital humanities research and practice and seeding the future projects. This relies heavily on the availability of travel budgets and funds to host visiting scholars and researchers, as well as conferences and attendance. And this needs willingness. It also needs institutional support, not forgetting that important one as well. So with that, I shall finish up now. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will stop sharing my screen. Still Thank you so much for your uh, in very in interesting uh, presentation, and thanks for in introducing my our uh, web page. Thanks so much. Okay. I'm very, very pleased. Uh, very pleased to do that, and I will be promoting it at <laughs> the talk that I give. Thank, Thank you so much. Okay.